This is the first video key for the IR plus mass spec packet that I've posted on the course website and I advise you to attempt these first before looking at the key here so that you have gone through the struggle, have, have tried various structures and, and through process of elimination um, you found one that you think fits the, the most accurately to these spectra. So the struggle helps teach you um, and the key can help show you where you've made some um, incorrect uh, logical assumptions about putting the piece together because this really is just solving a puzzle. So let's look at what we're after here. So when you have mass spec and IR and no NMR to help, we're going to glean the or we're going to gain the um, knowledge of the functional groups from the IR. That's our first thing that we want to do. And then we can get the, me the molecular formula and the fragments from the mass spec that can help tell us what our molecule actually is. So if we have an IR, we always diagram it by drawing a vertical line at 1500 and 3000 and then we reference, that's wave numbers, we reference um, our peaks from those um, to see what we have. And so a uh, broad peak to the left of 1500 um, in, the, in this region is going to be a CO double bond for sure. CC double bonds would be a lot sharper than that and they'd be accompanied by SP2 CHs to the left of 3000. We don't have that. We have the SP3 CHs to the right of 3000. So that's the information we get from the IR and we can move on because we're ignoring the fingerprint region and we move on. There is something to be gained from looking at the exact wave numbers of this peak. Does it have more double bond or single bond character? Um, but for this compound, we're, we're over 1,700, close to 1,800. Um, it could be a number of factors that could cause that to move, so we're going to need to go to the mass spec to get more information. So here we are, and let's get a closer look at this. So um, the molecular ion, first thing we do is find the molecular ion and then label it on our spectrum. So given our mass spec, we see the peak here at 102 is, is the highest that I can see. Is that a blip? Can't tell. Look at our table. 102 is the highest thing that registered. There is no 101, so 102 can't be an isotope peak. And so therefore, we're going to call this 102 is the molecular ion, the highest non-isotopic peak in the spectrum. And then the thing that we need to do is label the masses of our major fragments in each little cluster of signals, so we're going to label those all the way to about halfway down the spectrum, and so about to the 50 mark, well the base peaks below 50, so I'll sneak down and get the base peak in, but let's label these. So we've got 89, 89 88, 87, so that's odd, 75, 74, hmm, that one's even, but 71 is odd, 59 is odd, and 55 is odd, and then we have 43. So when we have an even ion among odd fragments, that tells us that we've either got loss of water or a McClafferty rearrangement. And here, 102 minus 74 is M minus 28, so this should scream at us McClafferty rearrangement. So we know that we've got something that can adopt um, this arrangement in its atoms so that it puts a hydrogen next to the um, atom with the radical and, and cation. So we know that we've got that arrangement leading to the loss of 28. Okay, so we'll see that coming up. What's 87? It's M minus 15, so we know that's loss of methyl. 71, 102 minus 71 is 31. So this one tells us something. The only way to get 31 is oxygen, 16 plus 15 is 31. Okay, so an ethyl group would be 29, but the only way to get to 31 is to have a, is to have a methoxy loss here. So we're losing um, that OCH3. So that is evidence of an sp3O that's not the same as the carbonyl O that we've seen. There's no way to lose an OCH3 from a CO double bond, which we know is there from the IR. So we have to account for an extra oxygen in our molecular formula. So we've got an O2 situation here. So at this point we've got enough information to posit a pretty reasonable molecular formula. If we finish out, we've got M-43 
here, which is a propyl group, CH2, CH2, CH3. Uh, we've got 55, we've got 43, but let's see what we can glean from the rest of these um, now based on the molecular formula that we posit here. So C CXHYO2, well, what do we do? Well, we take 102 and let's subtract away these two oxygens. So 2 times 16 is 32. That's from the two oxygens that were taken away 32 to get 70. Okay, and so when we do that, we can then take that 70, divide it by CH or 13 to get 70 divided by 13 to make sure is C5, H5 with a remainder. So we've got to have a remainder added in and then O2 we know. So what's the remainder? Well, 13 times 5 is 65. So 70 minus 65 is 5 more H's. So I'm going to add those in the molecular formula. We get C5, H10, O2, and that adds up to the molecular ion 102. Is that a reasonable molecular formula? Well, let's check. The degrees of unsaturation is 1 plus the number of carbons plus the number of nitrogens over 2, which there are none. Um, oxygen doesn't count. Minus the number of hydrogens plus halogens over 2. One degree of unsaturation, or unsaturation matches with our CO pi bond um, very nicely. So we, we feel like this is a pretty reasonable molecular formula. I like it. I think it's good. Okay, so now we've got to explain away the fragments that we have here. Okay, and so if we look, there are several. That OCH3 tells us something very important. Okay, it tells us that we probably have this feature in our molecule because esters such as this like to do alpha cleavage here and here. And so if we do alpha cleavage from a ketone, draw in the charges here, drew it on the other side, but that's okay. Meet in the middle, pi bond, one left over. We're going to lose that OCH3 as a radical. And then the ion that we see at M minus 31 is going to be this compound. Okay? And so alpha cleavage on the other side, well, we know that we've got three carbons left because we have C5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, C5. If we have this ester, or we have this ester, we could have alpha cleavage here or here to give M minus 43. Okay? And so we pick between those two because we see that M minus 28, so this would yield a loss of a propyl group that's M minus, that's a 43 mass, 14 plus 14 plus 15, leaving us with an ion here at M minus um, 43. The same ion would result from fragmentation of this ester and it would leave an isopropyl group. We know isopropyl and propyl are isomers of one another, so they both weigh 43. And we get the same ion that we have in the first example. So we've got to tell those two esters apart. And the way we do that is by the McClafferty rearrangement. The ester on the left can perform this McClafferty rearrangement, form a sigma bond, break a sigma bond, form a pi bond, break a sigma bond. When we do that, we get an even mass fragment shown there at M minus 28 
And there's our 28 that we lose. We lose an ethylene from the McClafferty rearrangement. The other ester cannot explain the McClafferty rearrangement. And so that leaves us with the M minus 15, so that we've, we've explained McClafferty, we've explained M minus 31, we've explained propyl. This M minus 15 is going to give us trouble because our book does not teach us, the textbook that we're using doesn't teach us how to account for the M minus 15. What are some ways that you might have proposed that when you were working this problem for M minus 15? And we'll talk about why they don't work. So what if we had this? Okay, so if we have that molecule, we could get an M minus 15 from an alpha here. But then we would also expect to see um, a McClafferty rearrangement on the other side of the molecule that has a mass that's too great to be 28. We wouldn't expect to see M minus 28 if we rearrange this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. we would end up losing from a McClafferty this fragment which is 14 plus 13 plus 15 is M minus would be M minus 42. That's a mass of 42 so we would end up with this compound M minus 42 and we don't see that in the mass spec so it disobeys the McClafferty. Okay? Well, if we did one that obeyed the McClafferty for this, such as this structure, it's an isomer, one, two, three, four, five carbons, two oxygens, correct number of unsaturations. We get a McClafferty that would yield an M minus 28. But then we couldn't explain the M minus 15, okay? because the other side here would give M minus 29 as a major fragment. Okay, so that's a couple you might have seen. So all three of these structures, even the one that I showed you above, has a problem with the way we've learned fragmentation. There's a whole bunch of fragmentation methods that we haven't learned. And to tell these apart, um, given conflicting evidence, we need to use HNMR. Okay, so that's the way we're going to nail down a structure like this. You'll have enough information on any exam that we give you um, to move forward with HNMR to find the solution. Now, I am going to show you the fragmentation mechanism that results in M-15 here for esters and amides and anything that has a heteroatom here. So for ester, that could be an NH2, could be an O. We just said it was this ester is what we have. Well, it turns out that you can rearrange hydrogens to a rearrangement here for esters after they ionize in the mass spec. They rearrange putting a hydrogen here and a radical here. And then you follow up that rearrangement with an alpha cleavage which gives you this ion plus the methyl radical and this is M minus 15. So yes, it is consistent with the mass spectrum but you would but it takes more information than our textbook gets into and thus you need to move on if you get to a place where you have conflicting evidence use NMR to nail down fine structure. Okay, don't waste 40 minutes looking at the mass spec if you're given an NMR. For this one, if you weren't given an NMR, the McClafferty and the alpha cleavage le leading to M-21, so M-28 and M-31 also confirmed the structure of our original molecular ion here as well. The best evidence is McClafferty and that alpha cleavage from before. Okay, but move on to the, to the NMR if you run into conflicting evidence because there can be fragments that we aren't um, aware of how to uh, solve for in the mass spec without taking a much larger, much longer class on mass spec than this. We're getting the bare bones, the quick information that we can use to then move on to the NMR 
to nail down the fine structure.